Hello? Good, good. How about you guys? It looks like you're uh, just taking down the matriarch here. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're uh, taking the matriarch, and uh, I think we're about to release the uh, rat nurturing. Yep. Oh, so is that what the fans voted for, releasing? What a beautiful bug. Um, right now, yeah, we're... It, the way we have it set up is we have two different uh, ways for donating. You can either donate to Renegade or Paragon. And uh, right now, uh, from what I can tell from the message, Paragon is winning. This kind of upsets me because I'm a Renegade player and my like, Cannon Shepherd that I personally play, so I, I'm very upset with your fans right now. Um, <laughs> so you guys have been up I, I all know, night playing this I game? Know. I, I was expecting it was a close race. Um, let's see if I can get the yes, uh, I was. I spent a good few hours uh, alone last night, and then uh, these two came by. Uh, that was good to help me out. <laughs> That's um, good. Uh, so that lots of Red Bull and things like that. Later. I think we have like yeah, a two yeah, second so delay between I'm, us, by the way. I am exhausted right now, but I'm pulling through. Oh, uh, yeah, um, now let me see if I can do this trick for this one second. Wait, am I getting on the same track? You, yeah, it's fine. Can I save before that? No. Is that a thing I can do? Okay, uh, uh just let me see if I can do it right now. now. Oh, let's see. If I can not, let me go around and keep playing so I can. So I don't have to see that again. And some people in the chat are saying my mic is kind of low. I'm not sure. Hello, can you hear me fine now? Yes, I can hear you fine now. Uh, All right. These people in the chat here are saying they like the Excellent. Uh, Sunday? Okay. I'm enjoying all the misspellings of my name in the uh, chat already. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's this is what happens when you have an ethnic name. Yeah, yeah. All right, so how do you pronounce your last name? Cause I, I'm uh, it's pronounced hair. Hair? Okay. Yeah, even though it's not like air, it's pronounced hair. Yeah, I was not sure how to go about doing that. Yeah, no worries. Even my friends don't know usually. Okay, cool. Um, God, I'm feeling so echoey right now. But anyway, um, so yeah, you uh, were what senior designer for yeah. Mass Effect Three, correct? Yeah, I worked with the uh, gameplay team on Mass Effect Three uh, for about the last e a little over a year. I got to Bioware Montreal. I'm in the Montreal studio, so Montreal and Edmonton worked kind of in conjunction uh, on Mass Effect 3. Um, so we did a lot of the multiplayer in Montreal. I worked on single player, like powers, most of the time with some of the Edmonton guys. Uh, I happened to be the only gameplay designer in Montreal, actually, which meant I was spending a lot of time on VidCon uh, with, with my Edmonton homies. Um, so, yeah, okay, so, have you worked previously for Bioware, or was it just, like, you know, a happy circumstance, you're the only developer in the area, so they brought you on for three specifically? Uh, well, no, so, like, I used to work in Wisconsin at a company called Raven Software. I worked on a 2009 version of Wolfenstein, which nobody bought. Um, then I was working on another project as a lead designer for a bit, um, and it got canceled, unfortunately, and Raven got kind of put on Call of Duty Black Ops and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 support, like, to help out all the other, because that's a big push at Activision. And having worked on a first-person shooter for, like, four and a half years, I was kind of sick of it. So I decided, to, like, five years into that company, good time to, you know, start looking for a new job. And I kind of didn't like living in Wisconsin. Um, I'm a more of a big city guy. 
So I just started looking around. And I actually I talked to Ray and Greg, who co-founded the company. I got to meet them a few uh, a, a year earlier at a conference at Dice in Vegas. Got them their my information. Uh, they were hiring for the Montreal studio because the Montreal studio is kind of growing. It's pretty new for Bioware, and it was kind of a perfect fit. Mass Effect is probably my favorite current generation game, so um, it was an absolute perfect fit, like perfect timing. Everything worked out really well, and super excited just to be a part of the team. Yeah, no worries. I forgot how to how do I turn off the echo in Skype without having an echo on? Someone on the feed's asking if Raven did Jedi Knight three. I'm pretty sure there was no Jedi Knight three. Uh if only there was Well, okay, actually no no, actually that would be correct. It's uh Jedi Knight Jedi Academy and Jedi Outcasts were done, so I guess maybe that counts as Jedi Knight three. I did not work on those games for the person asking. I worked on Wolfenstein, and I worked on the prototype for Singularity, uh, but only for like three months on that. Okay, so um, what was your favorite part we have uh, working on um, uh, Mass Effect 2? Like, what was the coolest thing for you doing there? You know, for me, uh, in my career, like, I'm, I'm very... Uh, I'm very goal oriented and I wanted to always work on game of the year quality products. And what I mean by that is when you work at, on games that, you know, maybe are, are good, but they're not the highest caliber, you end up doing a lot of following. You end up looking at a lot of other games and going, well, what are they doing? And you're just trying to replicate it because you're kind of behind the ball. And that's not an interesting or great way to make games in my opinion. And what's nice about a game like Mass Effect is there really isn't, you know, it's, it's a hybrid of different genres. It's a hybrid of action and RPG. It's doing story and story over three games that no one else is really doing. Um, and I think that mix is kind of unique and that makes this game a leader. It might be a leader of nobody because like no one's really like trying to do exactly what we're doing, but it's, it's interesting and obviously fans love the game. So doing a game that didn't feel derivative or like it was a copycat, feeling that like we were, we were really pushing boundaries and that we could kind of and that it was our own IP, uh, intellectual property. So, like, you know, we don't have to go back to a licensor and go, like, well, is this okay to do? Because I've worked with licensors before, and it's, it's difficult. They'll go, well, we don't want you to have gadgets in your game, or we don't want you to have – we don't want your game to be mature. They should be teen because we want to hit a broader audience. And you're like, no, the game should be mature. It's, uh, so you have those arguments. So, really, just being in control like that – and when I say in control, I mean – I'm not the one in control. I still just take, you know, do what I'm told to do. But the franchise is there. So I know that, hey, Casey is the executive producer or Preston is the lead designer. If there's an issue that I disagree with, I can go up to those guys directly and say, hey, I, I disagree with this. And I think we should change it. And they'll they'll listen. They might not act on it. They might not agree, but they'll listen. And that, that matters so much. I can barely hear who just asked the question. I'm getting a lot of static now, and like next to no, uh, I can't hear anything. It, it was better when I was talking a few, like a minute ago. All of a sudden, okay. can you hear me better right now? Yeah, that's better. Okay, I think we're just gonna have to stick with this functionality then. It's gonna be hard to hear me, but. Um for the people in the stream, but this is what I got for now. Um, so I was saying, uh, what specifically did you work on in Mass Effect? Like, what specific uh, area were you designing? Sure. Um, so I actually had an interesting... Kind of, I, so when I started the company, I started as a uh, senior level designer. But the thing is, I've never really done level design before, and that was really the position they had open, and I was willing to take a chance. So I ended up building an early version of one of the multiplayer maps that ended up shipping with the game. Uh, I took it maybe like halfway through development and another guy finished it off and made it way better than what I started with. Um, but really, my background was computer science, programming systems, and designing systems, so I moved to the gameplay team a little over a year ago, uh, and basically I worked about worked on the powers for the game 
Uh, not alone. I, I worked with uh, another group of guys. The whole gameplay team is like five of us on the design side. Um, and we worked on power. So there's something like 53, 57 powers if you count. All the passive powers, the new powers, the old powers, the bonus powers, the henchman powers, all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, there's even the power uh, for the uh, new character in the DLC as well that I had to do uh, after we went the main game. Um, so basically, yeah, I basically spent my entire time just working on power stuff. Okay, cool. Um, so, like, how much uh, do you carried over from Mass Effect 2 in regards to those uh, powers that you were working on? Were those just a base you used, or was it, like... Uh, you know, something a bit more new. Uh, no, we, we did try to, so, you know, when you go from Mass Effect 1 to Mass Effect 2, obviously Shepard dies. We kind of have a nice, convenient narrative reason to start you over at level 1, to change your class, to, and, and obviously the power between 1 and 2 is completely different, right? Like, it's so... There's, like, a thousand powers to choose from in 1 that is daunting, and in 2 you're like, here's 4. Um, and it's, it's, it's very focused. So in three, we wanted to build off of two better and we didn't want to kill the player off or make them start over at level one if they brought, um, the, if they imported their characters. So what we did is we basically kept all the powers, uh, the same from two to three that you start with. And then what we did is we added one new regular power to every single class. And we added one uh, new passive power, which we were calling like a melee passive. I think it's called fitness at the end of the game. We changed the name of that a few times, so I, I could be wrong. Uh, but I believe it's called fitness, and that's like a melee passive, and it's more... Def so there's one passive that ha handles like your weapon damage and your paragon renegade outputs and all that. And the other one's like your melee uh, strength and your shields and your, your health and, and things like that. Um, the bonus powers were we were a little less likely to keep around. We we were more than happy to cut out bonus powers that didn't fit, that we didn't like, or that just didn't feel right, and we created some new bonus powers from there. Um, and then we found a way to kind of put them along all of the different uh, the different henchmen that we have in the game. Uh, henchmen is the term we use for all your squad members. Um, so basically. You, you put those different powers on the henchmen and you dole them out. And so what we have is a good mix of powers that came from ME2, and we have a good mix of new powers. Uh, there was one interesting power, which was uh, the engineer's AI hacking from ME2, which we actually had to do a lot more work on. It's the only power that's kind of radically changed. So in ME3, it's called sabotage. And the reason is AI hacking is all about hacking the geth. But in ME3, you're not fighting Geth really that much in the game. It's it's more about, you know, taking on the Reapers. Uh, and you have to deal with Cerberus at times. So we kind of had to, like, rejigger re that, that power to kind of work for ME3. And so we were willing to do those sorts of things and not just keep around kind of crappy power that wouldn't be as great for ME3 because of our enemy types. Uh, but for the most part, we kind of stuck with what we had. Uh, but upgraded. And there's lots of new upgrades. That's the other thing. Okay, so, yeah, I've noticed uh, in the Mass Effect demo, um, there are a lot of new changes. How did uh, that design change between single player and two player for you? Was there, like, anything consciously you had to do different, or was it essentially just same thing um, be between single player and multiplayer? Yeah, no, it's, it, there is uh, a change. Uh, I have to give credit to one of the designers, Eric Fanyan, who kind of was the guy who helped me with powers the entire time, kind of was my mentor, because he did that work on ME2. And then he basically was handling the multiplayer side of things. Uh, he's over in Edmonton. And so there was a few problems we hit. Like, one would be balance, right? So sometimes we would find that, like, oh, this power is completely overpowered in multiplayer, or it's overpowered if there's, like, four, when there's four people around. And so we started tweaking numbers in multiplayer, making multiplayer versions. And the other thing that people probably don't really realize or think about, frankly, is performance. Like, our game... You know, our game and our powers and all the effects and the sounds and stuff that play, we do that, it, it, that works really well when there's one guy on screen, you and your henchman. When there's four people on screen at once doing it, it can, like, bring the game to a crawl. So we had to go back and, like, pull back on some of the uh, visual effects for multiplayer, some of the other stuff to kind of just optimize the game. And we pull back in a way that's, like, hopefully the end player doesn't really 
recognize or notice that there's something wrong. Uh, like wrong is the incorrect word. Something different than single player. It just feels right, and it still performs. The, you know, the frame rate's a lot, it's still a lot better for multiplayer. Um, so yeah, it was, it was things like that, as well as the balance. And what was it like working uh, in the studio that really has like two offices uh, in two completely separate cities? Like, was it more difficult trying to work between the Edmonton and uh, I forget what the other office was? It's the Montreal. I'm in the Montreal office. Okay. Uh, yeah. Was there any difference between like traveling things, or was it just everything was purely digital, so it was a bit easier, or? No, I, I would say face-to-face -face is always the best way to work, especially in a big game. So the second you're starting to work uh, over multiple studios, multiple time zones, like there is some loss there. Now we tried to minimize that loss. Um, so we use VidCon a lot and, you know, that way we have big video conferences and we look at the game. But that's, and we, we got this thing called Spawn Labs, basically. So if somebody was playing the game in Edmonton, we could see it, you know, without having to look at a like a webcam pointed at a TV, the bad like video quality will get out of that. Spawn Labs helped us kind of get a better picture of what's going on. So that came on great. Right. Um, but the real thing you miss when you work in two different studios is those little conversations that happen in the halls or right around people's desks. And so you have to be a lot more diligent to loop people in. So for example, I was the only gameplay designer in Montreal which meant I was kind of like on an island by myself and working with just Edmonton people, which meant I had to go extra out of my way when I was stuck to ask someone a question or to go, hey, what did you guys talk about here? Or, hey, I can't make this meeting. Can someone make sure you loop me in? Or, hey, can you make sure that you fill me in on all these little decisions that you made, uh, you know, having a beer at, at the uh, pub, pub last night? Um, and it's just about diligence. It'll never replace face-to-face -face communication. But we made it work, I think. You know, there were, there were rough spots where you're just like, I have no idea what's going on over there. And there were times where I didn't know where some of my coworkers were doing on the gameplay team because I was kind of just working on powers and they were just churning on weapons or uh, AI and they did an amazing job with all that stuff. Um, but then you would see it a few days later or weeks later and you'd be like, holy crap, that's amazing. Nice. So uh, what was it kind of like also... Uh knowing that you had to uh, sort of program for uh, all the major uh, platforms, like, you know, for the 360, PS3, and PC. Uh, you know, is it kind of easily transferable between them? Is there anything that like, automatically translates? Or do you have to, you know, have someone individually parse out the code for each console? What you try to do generally is uh, set your code base up so that the vast majority of your code is just the same across all three platforms. Um, that's not 100% possible, especially with the architecture difference between the PS3 and the 360 and, and PC. The 360 and PC are pretty close. Uh, the PS3 is its own different kind of hairy beast, frankly. So what you do is you, you set that architecture up and then there are like hardcore programmers who are way smarter and more talented than me who go and they, they handle the optimization per platform and do the little things that need to be done behind the scenes, like memory management and you know the sound processing and all that sort of thing uh, to make it work on those different platforms. The, the nice thing that happened the nice thing that happened for us was Mass Effect 2, uh, a PS3 version was made later. And so that kind of became the beginning of what the Mass Effect 3 engine was, because a lot of the hard work to make our engine work on PS3 was done then. So then we could start building off of that uh, more solid base for you know Mass Effect 3. And that was really helpful, and the engineers did an amazing job trying to do that. Uh, I know some people have mentioned that there's you know some frame rate issues occasionally on the PS3, and and it and it doesn't. Unfortunately, all the platforms are never going to be the same. Like I had a friend come over to me, and he was like. Oh, I played all the Mass Effect games on 360, and then I got an awesome computer now, and I played it on PC, and it's running at like 60 frames a second. And now I'm sad because consoles aren't going to run at 60 frames a second. It's because the PC could just be so much more powerful. Uh, that, that it's you, it's a balancing act, right? There's never a perfect solution, unfortunately. But I think we did a pretty good job at the end of the day. Okay, so personally, you know, completely unrelated from a uh, profession, what console do you prefer? Uh, I do personally play on the 360 more. Um, there's a few reasons for that. I, I think a the I have more games on the 360, and I bought. So when a game is cross-platform, 
I, I think what you find in general is uh, games that are cross-platform tend to uh, tend to perform a little bit better on the 360. At least, especially that was really definitely the case early on. Now it's a little, it's a, a lot better. But early on in the console's history, like those first few PS3 games, and when there was a 360 version, the 360 version was way better. Like it just was a lot smoother. Didn't have all these like visual tearing and stuff like that. And um, so because of that reason, I got that. And then if I want to play with friends online, like most of my friends are on Xbox Live. I don't play a ton of multiplayer. I'll obviously play, be playing a ton of Mass Effect multiplayer. Um, but I play mostly co-op multiplayer. Like I played through Gears of War 3 co-op with my best friend back from actually, the, I'm from the DC area actually too, by the way. Uh, I grew up in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, so not too far from where you guys are. Um, so I'll play with my buddy, you know, back back home, and we'll play through Gears of War 3, and, and that's great to do on the 360. Uh, I do have some amazing games on the PS3, though, like the Uncharted series is one of my favorite. Like, Uncharted 2 is just absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, Dark Souls and Demon Souls are, are phenomenal games that are, you know, the first one at least, at least was only on the 360, or the uh, PS3, I believe. Um, so I do use my PS3 a decent amount, and PS3 has some amazing indie games. I'm a big indie game guy. Um, so like everyday shooter and some of the pixel junk games, uh, I, I love those things. And you can't get them on any other platform. I can't wait for Journey to come out from that game company in a couple of weeks, which looks just got amazing reviews this week and looks beautiful. Um, so I love all my consoles. I, I will admit, actually, I don't play my Wii very much. That's probably the least played console of everything. Uh, but I do tend to play on the 360 a little more. Yeah, I don't hear about the Wii thing. Like I picked it up, but now it's. I, I just can't bring myself to play anymore. You know, now I have a connect or move. Yeah, I don't have a connect or move. Uh, my, my apartment's kind of small. Um, I don't, so I don't haven't gotten those yet. But, um, yeah, the Wii, like, just doesn't have any games that I'm interested in. I, like, the last game I played a lot on it was, like, the Punch-Out, because I love Punch-Out. Uh, and I played that for, you know, 50-plus hours, and then I was kind of done, and I haven't picked up anything for the Wii since. Yeah, uh, definitely... I think that that's the long story of the Wii. Um, that, I know a lot of people and a lot of my readers are constantly asking me if I have you know, any tips for them to break into the games industry as a designer. And unfortunately, I'm a writer. I don't know anything about <laughs> right. that. Right. Do you have any tips that you'd like to share You know, based off your experience? Uh, yeah, uh, it's... You know, I, I got asked that question a lot, and I think there's some huge misconceptions because most people who ask that question don't realize they didn't get in the games. Actually, they think that games is like game design is coming up with ideas, and ideas are only like you know the beginning. It's all about the execution. There's a lot of games out there that have really amazing ideas but couldn't execute them well, and so what that means is you need to have some sort of ability to either code or uh, do art or level building or something that's gonna put something towards the end product so my suggestion always it sounds silly but like it's really just build games like there's so many ways to build games nowadays there's there's the udk there's unity there's uh all these there's game maker there's all these different things depending on what your programming or non-programming skill is that you can that let you make a game and just like make really shitty games and the more more games you make and the more crappy games you make, uh, eventually you'll start figuring out how to make good games, and like that'll come out of that. And if you love that creation of game, then you'll be made for this industry. But the thing that's really important for anybody who might be listening who wants to get into games is, like, just because you love playing games doesn't mean you'll love making games. They're very different beasts. Like, there's a reason that this is a very difficult job, and, and you have still love the act of creation and not just oh I love playing games okay now have, have you like started to kind of turn a more critical eye to the games that you play now that you're actually sitting there designing them like have you ever played a game and be like oh why did they do this they could just you know change this or this so much better uh, yeah, other fun part of being a video game developer, designer, uh, basically most games are ruined at this point. Like, you know exactly what they did or about what they did, and you see all the little warts that nobody else would ever see. Or you just sit there, and you're like, oh, how did they implement this cover thing? And then you start to play with it for like 10 minutes at home, and you're like, wait, I'm not playing the game at all. I'm like getting into analytical mode. So you gotta learn to turn that part of your brain off. It's kind of hard. It does, it'll never fully turn off, but it's kind of in the background there absorbing information but yeah no game games are a little 
they're less fun. I still love playing video games. I'm not saying I don't like video games, but they are some of the magic is gone, right? Like you know, you've been to the sausage factory. You see how the sausage is made. Uh, it's it's not as sexy maybe all, all the time. Now, what do you think of uh, the game or non-game, depending on uh, some people's interpretations? Uh, Dear Esther, have you had a chance to get your hands on that? Absolutely, I I, I played through it a couple weeks ago. Uh, I, I that is not a kind of game I would normally play or think I would like. That's not the kind of games I'm interested in making. It's a very exploratory, narrative-driven game. The only mechanic is walk, really. Um, and what's amazing is I got to the end of that. It's about an hour and 45 minutes, I think, it took me to play. Um, and I was almost crying at the end. Like, there were tears in my eyes. Like, no lie. Like, it was so emotionally impactful. And... I hate the concept uh, that people go, this is not a game or this is a game, because that's a completely reductive uh, discussion. Whether or not it's the kind of game you're interested in or the kind of game that you believe games should be is different. You're allowed to have your opinion on that. But it is still a game. Um, and what we need to be doing as an industry is going wide and trying all these different amazing of creating games and pushing the envelope and some will work and some won't and maybe some will be really niche like Dear Esther or something but you can't say that's not a game because it really just harms our ability to grow as an art form and be more more successful uh, and I don't mean successful monetarily but I mean just like acceptance among mass mass media or mass just the people so I, th I definitely think Dear Esther is a game I think anybody who can handle playing a game that isn't just shooting things should go to Steam, buy Dear Esther for ten dollars, support those guys. It's amazing. Um, it's 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 an absolutely wonderful product that I, that I thought was emotionally impactful, and I think really challenged my ideas on what games are or can be. Because again, like I said, that's I'm a systems guy. I build like you know powers and systems and all that sort of stuff. I I feel like hey. Games are about that dynamics and, and all those interactions, not just walking around. But that walking around was just as impactful. Okay, so you, you also just mentioned uh, games as art and kind of improving the uh, industry through that. But like, how important do you think that concept is to some of your uh, you know, fellow designers and uh, developers? Like, is it something that's constantly on their mind, or is it just you know, build what we like best and then, you know, see how it fits into the great picture later? Um, you know, I think everybody has their own different ways. Some people go, what are the... So, so some way, one way of building games, not my personal favorite way, is go, what's popular? What will make a lot of money? And how can I build that? Or what are the mechanics that already exist for that? And what can I take from those and kind of, you know, put out in a more polished form to make money? You, you see this happening all over the industry in, in social and AAA and, and less than indie. Uh, but it still happens in India as well, on mo and on mobile. Um, that, to me, is n a non-ethical way of building a game. And I don't mean like being influenced by something. I mean like straight-up copying. That's not ethical. Uh, however, the thing of, I'm just going to build a game that I want to play. I think that's a great way to build a game. Because you have passion behind it. And that passion will drive you when it's 1 in the morning and you're tired and you haven't seen your wife or kids or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever in a while and you're cranky and you, you know that passion is going to drive you and working on something that you don't believe in won't so I'm a firm believer in work on the kind of games you want some people want to work on things that would be considered very mass market some people want to work on Dear Esther and make some these really weird quirky indie games and like everyone should just do what they like and I think the audience will kind of come if you market yourself and market and you're doing something good and interesting like Dear Esther wasn't polished it didn't have awesome graphics and sound and really interesting writing and kind of a narrative it, it wouldn't work but that's what the game is about and they did make sure they spent all their money on that and it totally totally like works as a result so I'm a, just a big proponent of do what you love like I when I quit my last job, I came to Bioware because I was like, I want to work on the games that I love and that are the, the top tiered stuff. And it was definitely Mass Effect was like on the top of the list, maybe tied with like Fallout 3 at the time because Fallout's my favorite franchise ever. Like those were the two games that were like 1A, 1B. Um, and, and I made sure, I, I, and I said to myself, I was like, if I can't work at the jet place I want to work, I'll just 
go indie and make my own game. I'm not going to go work for a company and make 70 for me. Like, I, 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 I think I can do better, and I think that, you know, the people, I want to be around people who are pushing themselves in that way. Okay, now you just mentioned, uh, you know, AAA 70 rated games. Like, what is the difference between the ratings in these games? Because I've, you know, I, I've seen the terminology before, but I've never really been able to talk about a clear definition other than just... I know it when I see it. Sort of. uh, yeah, I think ratings are broken. I know I use the term, but ratings are kind of broken anyways. It's, it's kind of hard. In general, what I would say is a 70, like, like Wolfenstein that I worked on a couple of years ago, that was a 74, I think, or 75 when we finished. And, and, and I would, what I'd say is it was like there was a really fun game in there, and it was a lot of fun for a lot of time, but the pacing was kind of off. The story was bad. Uh, and it, w it wasn't as polished as it could be. I think it's all about polish. Um, the thing about Bioware games are they're very polished for the most part. Like, and the time we take between like alpha and beta is like way more than most companies take. And I think that's where a lot of the polish comes. Because if you played, if you played Mass Effect three in say October, you might be worried that we're not gonna finish or like what the hell is going on? Like it's crazy. But then like October, November, December come. And you play it again at the end of December when we're effectively done. And you're like, holy crap, this is like a hugely different game. And it's all that little polish. It's all that everything is coming together at once. The cinematics are finally done. The sound got put on top of it. The effects are there. The post-processing is there. The little design tweaks are there. The VO is in instead of it being robo-voice talking like this, Shepard. Like, all that stuff matters so much. Um, and so, yeah, I really think the difference between those games is that polish and that and the execution of, of, of what the core mechanics of that game are. And Bioware has just a very clear lineage of RPG. Uh, like how, how much does that kind of like pressure you and other designers working on a new RPG to kind of live up to that past of like Baldur's Gate, Knights of the Old Republic, Mass Effect 1, Dragon Age Origins? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a huge pressure, but I, I for me at least, I can only speak for myself, it's the kind of pressure that I like. It's the pressure that makes me perform better like i work well like at chaos <laughs> like at the edge of chaos basically um and so that pressure means that we hold ourselves to a higher standard um but what it also means is that we're not beholden to just creating what other people have held so there are some people uh, including fans who go like mass effect 3 isn't an rpg at all because it doesn't fit their traditional definition of a D and D RPG like the old Baldur's Gates and Nightingales, Fallout, things like that. And but what we're looking for at Bioware is always to be expanding and pushing what game design is and the design of what games are, right? And so I think we did something interesting by kind of blending the action the third person cover action genre with the RPG and deep story and narrative genre. And like that's something that people haven't done as much. Um and whether or not you want to debate, is that an RPG? You know, like, I certainly think it's an RPG. I think it's a very different style of RPG. In the same way that Diablo did years ago, like when Diablo came out, people were, were like, is Diablo an RPG? Because the stats kind of auto-upgrade for you. You just click a lot. And I was like, well, it's an action RPG. It's a different kind of action RPG than Mass Effect. So the past matters because we want quality. And we want to be known for being leaders in the industry and creating the best like narrative-driven games. But it also means that we're not going to just create things because they worked in the past. In fact, we're going to take risks and try things to push the genre in the future to keep being that leading edge company. Because if you stand still, all the other companies are going to catch up and all the other games will be doing what we're doing. And then we have no competitive edge. Like, we want to be on the next thing. So whatever the next you know thing we work on is, I'm sure it's going to be different than what the products we've been working on currently are in some way. Okay, and uh, just completely unrelated. Um, you mentioned before that you'd worked on uh, the like 2009 Wolfenstein game. Did you also have to have any hand in the uh, Enemy Territory open source uh, game that came out? Oh God, I, I wish. Uh, I I was in high school when that came out. Or I think maybe early college. It was like 1999, 2000. And I played Enemy Territory. That is actually the last multiplayer game, like competitive multiplayer game, that I like got super into. I, I played that probably like hundreds of hours over the uh, 
uh, over my summer break, I actually remember having dreams about like capturing points or being this like the, the covert op in uh, enemy territory. So while I wish I could say I had anything to do with that, no, uh, I had nothing to do with enemy territory. It's a wonderful game um, that was made by I believe Splash Damage made it, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was an absolutely wonderful kind of like free mod that came, or not even mod, but like free expansion that came out. Yeah, I, I remember just uh, getting completely into that game when I was in high school, so I just wanted to make sure. Um, but yeah, I've been asking a lot of questions. I, I want to uh, open it up to the uh, live chat I have set up to, you know, if you guys have any questions uh, you want to ask, please type them, you know, and uh, you know, we'll see what we can get answered. Um, you know, in the meantime, is there anything uh, you would like to ask us, uh, Mandy? You know, I'm always curious. What you know? What are you? What are your favorite parts of the franchise? I guess like w w what matters the most to you? Is it the characters that you pick up? Is it the combat? Is it the like the moral decisions, the ethical dilemmas that occur? Uh, for me, it's uh, such a grand combination of them all. I am a huge fan of any narrative-driven game. Uh, just you know, as someone who writes and reads all the time. You know, that, that's perhaps one of the most important things to me. And, you know, especially in Mass Effect 2, when we had to debate, uh, you know, what do we do with uh, the Geth, uh, the Geth fanatics? Do we convert them or do we destroy them? And it's that sort of moral decision that if you're reading a book, uh, reading a paper, um, you know, you uh, can sit there and think hypothetically about it. Like, oh, I would totally do this. But... In a video game, in an interactive medium, it's not hypothetical anymore. The game stops then. You have to make a decision, and that's really when you're forced to actually confront what you actually do. And I, I think that's, you know, one of the most important things to me for this franchise is making us confront our inner demons and ask ourselves the tough questions that we can't necessarily get the answers to in any other way. Cool. Yeah, no, that's actually a lot of the same things why I like the game. The ethical dilemma is that kind of narrative, but there's a really good mechanical base, base behind it uh, that lets me kind of push forward. Yeah. Um, uh, someone wants to know, what was the process like in creating the Prothean squad mate from a designer's point of view? Yeah, so I, I worked on the power um, for him. Um, the power is called Dark Channel. Um, and so myself and a few of the other designers in Edmonton kind of started throwing out ideas for new powers as we usually do when we have to like brainstorm a new power. Um, and, and we started thinking about like, well, what would be interesting and what fits the kind of character that the Prothean is? And so we decided to go with this power uh, that's, you, you cast it and it puts the damage over time, a dot on the enemy to cast it. And it, it pretty, chooses them really fast and it lasts like 30 seconds, which is really long. Like warp does the damage over time, but does not last like more than four to six seconds, depending on what upgrades you have, I think. Um, and so what we did with that is, because it's, like no one's ever going to be alive for 30 seconds if this thing is on them, we made it this kind of crowd control damage over time power that when you cast it on somebody and it killed them, it would jump to somebody else close by if they were within range. So it almost comes like this virus power. It's like It's like the plague, you know? Like, you, you, you catch it. And so it kind of becomes like, hey, you can control this whole area of, of enemies. And we thought that was an interesting way for the Prothean to kind of work. Uh, it kind of fit who his character was narratively, which I'll let you guys discover more uh, in, in when you actually play the DLC, if you play the DLC. Someone's asking, is uh, Javik, uh, who's the Prothean's name, a biotic? Yeah, he's definitely a biotic. Um, or he has some biotic tendencies, I should say. Uh, and so, like... That was the design for me. Like now, the character design, I can't really speak for those. You know, the the character artists did a great job of you know making that that creature come to life. Um, you know, as well as the voice actor did an interesting job with like and, and the post process that we have kind of going on him um, to kind of make him an interesting character. Like I don't really know what went into all that because kind of just happened and there was a character one day and I was like, make a power for him. Actually, I didn't have to make the power when he was around. Like. I just knew I had to make a power. I could I could put it on Liara, right? And just for testing purposes. I could put it on Shepard just for testing purpose. Um, for the person 
on the voice chat, I don't know who the voice actor is. Uh, anyways, so yeah, the, the, the process was the, the process was fun. It was it was a lot of brainstorming. I'll, I'll be honest, like we I was we had just finished kind of like our main stuff. We were kind of you know at the point where you're just seeing bugs when we started working on that. Because there's usually about a three month gap between when you finish the game and a game comes out. So like we were done at the end of December. Then January was just like last minute bug fixes to you know go into certification with Microsoft. And so we're working on all this stuff in that time period. And you're kind of tired. <laughs> frankly very 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 exhausted and bleary eyed and it's kind of like you're just trying to finish so luckily we had a good idea from an early stage and it kind of worked first time which doesn't always happen so we got kind of lucky i can imagine now what was it like when they kind of came to you and like hey there's this uh, character who belongs to a race that is supposed to not exist and we're like make something out of this like what was that like for you guys where you know it, it was something that, that at least most of us didn't know, like, there could be this sort of character. Right. Well, it, in a way, it's, it's liberating, actually, because while we have stories of the Protheans, we don't really know what they were like, right? So we have an, a chance to kind of make things without preconceived notions of what they should or shouldn't do. And that lets you explore things. But the funny thing about game design is that having the freedom, like no, having like little restrictions is actually the worst thing in the world because then your mind just goes everywhere and everything's a possibility. And if you have like constraints, like, well, no, I can't do that. So I'm just going to focus on the things I can do. And you come up with something a little more interesting faster. Um, so for us with, with the Prothean, like it was liberating in terms of we could, we could kind of craft him to work the way we want, wanted him to work. Um, but we didn't have to be beholden to something that everyone knows. Like, that's not the way he would be, because nobody really knows. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, someone a little bit further up in chat had an interesting question. Um, oh, I, I'm, I can imagine you aren't even allowed to talk about this, uh, but are there any plans for Mass Effect 4, and what about the rumors of the movie? Definitely can't talk about any future of the franchise uh, beyond we are doing DLC. I can't say what or how many DLCs beyond the Protein one that's announced for day one, but there will be more DLC, just like what you saw with Mass Effect 2. So we want to support the product uh, over time. Um, the movie, uh, it's been announced. We're doing it with Legendary Pictures. Uh, Casey Hudson, our executive producer and project director for all the games, is an executive producer on the film. Uh, you know, as a fan, even as a developer, the fan, I just hope it's you know a good movie. That it's uh, video, let's face it, video game movies don't have a great history. So I'm hoping that having our own guys involved and the fact that we had a really good narrative for Mass Effect One, uh, I think it's helpful. So I believe the movie is supposed to be uh, taking place around Mass Effect One, um, and the story was already really good. So like turning it into a Hollywood film shouldn't be too difficult. Let's see what happens. Obviously, I don't know anything about release dates. Like. If I did, I couldn't tell you, but I actually don't even know, so... Okay, and someone else wants to know, um, what was it like, uh, you know, it, uh, what did plan on doing with Evie as a squad mate? I don't know how to translate that properly. Uh, uh that, that, that sounds like I can't answer that without spo doing lots of spoilers, so I'm not going to answer that question. Okay. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to keep spoiler. I, I, I don't want to ruin the game for anybody. You know, I, I don't want to confirm things that we haven't publicly confirmed. I don't want to. I, I want everyone to have an awesome experience on March 6th or if you're in Europe, March 9th, um, and, and really hopefully enjoy the game. Like all the buzz I've been hearing from people who kind of have been playing the game already because they got review copies or whatever is good. So hopefully all the fans will enjoy it as well. Uh, I, I can definitely say I'm absolutely looking forward to. Uh... You know, playing the game. Uh, so, uh, let's see, any other questions? I mean, do you, is there anything you can comment on about the PS3 frame rate? You know, if there's going to be like day one patch to fix that at all? or? Oh, you know, I know some people have complained about some of the frame rate issues uh, on the PS3 and the demo. There was a lot of, op the demo was not final code. There was a lot of optimizations that happened uh, after that demo was built to try to make things better. In the, on the PS3 version, so uh, I'm pretty certain they are better in the final version. However, I'm I know there are still choppy points on the PS3. There's choppy points occasionally on the 360 as well. To be completely honest, it, it 
it just happens unfortunately sometimes um so so really the ps3 is definitely better in the final version um if it's it, better enough for what i was expecting i can't really the best job they could to try to get that thing running really well and for the most part it runs well there's scenes usually there's occasional cinematics and like scenes where there's lots of enemies where it dips for moments okay and uh, someone asked uh, you talked about game design polish what does or does the uh, work ethic mean you plan for lots of contingency time for your projects or you just say keep working on until it's done yeah, let's put it this way there's a reason the game got delayed right from uh fall of 2011 till now uh and it's yeah we we, we really care about the quality at the end of, of the game so frankly we miss internal deadlines a lot <laughs> like hey so we, Sorry about that. My door just opened and Dog was unhappy. Um, <laughs> nice. I was wondering what that was. Yeah, we, we uh, are, uh, George, stop. Right, we, we have nicknamed him Commander Sheepdog. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, what were we saying? I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> I uh, think we had Dog Park. Uh, do you contingency plan? Uh, yeah, so so what we do is when we're building our schedule, we build our schedule in a way that we know we're not going to hit everything day one. You want to build slack into the schedule. So if you go, hey, everything needs to be done on, let's say, the first of the month, you might want to give yourself, like, you need to have a contingency that goes, but if we need to go to the 15th, we can, but let's not try to do that. Um, and so the, the producers and the project managers do a good of kind of giving us the ability uh, of saying like, okay, well, we need more time. They go, okay, well, if you need more time, this is what it's going to cost. Like you're going to have to cut something else or you're going to have to prioritize what's important. And sometimes you go, okay, well, yeah, this is, this is we don't have time to do this well, so we're not going to do it at all. Um, like, and, and we've features because of that, because we knew we couldn't polish the awesome. And so I think as you're designing the game for Bioware, our polish is... We want to make the highest polished experience possible, and we want to prioritize what is the most important things, and we put our effort there first. Uh, and we miss sometimes we miss deadlines, and sometimes our game gets delayed three or four months. But frankly, had you guys played this game, the version of the game that we would have been done with in, let's say, November, you'd be so much unha so more unhappy than like what we with that three extra months that we got. Like, so much extra quality came out of that, um, and. So well, we have to do a better job of getting things on schedule, certainly, and doing a better job of contingency, and that's something we'll always try to improve. It's the game designers. You're not always going to hit... You can't just plan things out on paper and always hit them. And hit quality. Right, and I, I just want to give a quick shout-out real fast. Uh, we, there's about 10 minutes left for anyone who wants to donate. There's someone in the chat who uh, has agreed to match any donations made between... 12 and 1 Eastern Standard Time. So, you know, you have about 10 minutes. Get your donations in now, either Paragon or Renegade. We have some pretty big choices coming up. So, you should totally do Renegade choices, guys. Come on, Renegade's so much cooler. Yeah, but I mean... I'm, I'm, telling, sure. I'm telling everyone donating. I, I'm just going to push my own personal agenda here. <laughs> Go for it. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Any other... Uh, Will the choice of being able to play as Malakor Commander Shepard, do you reckon your video game should give you a choice? Definitely. Um, you know, it's costly in terms of voiceovers and animation work and stuff like that. But I'm a big proponent of... Like, I'm a big proponent of just wanting more diversity in our game characters, and that means both gender and race. So, like, my Commander Shepard, while I'm a male, I'm like a big black bald guy with like a dirty chin chin beard and that's because like i'm tired of playing the the stereotypical white space marine that saves the world personally um and the fact that mass effect lets me build the kind of character i want is great and so the more choices you have especially in rpgs which are uh, really about choice i think that's great now something like uncharted it makes little sense because it's a it's kind of a very authored character of who Nathan Drake is, and Mass Effect Shepard's kind of a shared authorship, where 
we write a lot of things about who Commander Shepard is, right? Like, you can never be Commander Shepard and murder 2,000 babies. Like, we're not going to do that. Spoiler, we don't let you murder 2,000 babies. I'm sorry to disappoint anybody. But at the same time, you make choices, right? So part of Commander Shepard's personality is your own, and part of it's what we wrote. Um, and so with things like that, the more choices you have, the more... I think we found that fans care about their character. They're like, hey, that's not what my... That's who my Commander Shepard is. And we find people say my a lot, like about Shepard. They're like, my Shepard would not do that. Uh, and that's a really interesting ownership thing where no one really goes my Nathan Drake or my Marcus Phoenix. Um, and that's because it's, those guys are trying to do different games, by the way. I love both of those games. I'm not trying to uh, diminish anything that they do, narratively or gameplay-wise. Uh, so, yeah, I, th I think choices are good for a game like ours. Um, it doesn't fit every game, but, you know... RPGs that you have lots of choices. Let, let the player choose what kind of person they are. If they're male, if they're female. Uh, you know, I would love to see other choices for me in the game like with, you know, sexuality. If you're homosexual, bisexual, you could have transgendered things like that come in. Characters, NPCs, race, race issues, and some some people go like, I don't want to deal with that stuff in video games, and that's fine. Not every video game needs to be about that or have that in there, but I think as an art form, we can really grow and expand when we start handling more diverse issues uh, and characters and building kind of more authentic worlds than maybe that, in general, the AAA industry doesn't really do right now. Okay, and just quick technical question. Do you know if there's going to be able to, uh, is there going to be split-screen capabilities for Mass Effect 3 multiplayer? No, we, we, we tested split screen pretty early on. We had it running in the office. But um, so what happens when you're doing split screen is you're rendering the screen twice, which takes twice, to, not twice, but almost twice the processing power. So you can imagine how bad the frame rate gets real, real fast. Um, and so what we decided was we can't deliver a really good experience uh, at split screen, even though it's a feature we want to do. So we decided, we made the tough decision to cut that kind of early on in development. Um, and, and I know, you know, that's kind of disappointing, but if you play split screen and it's all choppy and laggy and crappy, you would just be, you would just talk about how bad it is. And that wouldn't, wouldn't be great either. So we had to make that kind of tough decision. Okay. Um, now, here's a question. Did you say if uh, I just met, K did you say Caden or Ashley? Ashley. I definitely, I'm a male shepherd. So, like, to me, you know, the choices between uh, semi-racist and Ashley or Caden, who is kind of just a little boring to me, personally. It's all personally. I, uh, so, I decided to kill Caden. Uh, okay, and how many of your uh, shipmates have survived uh, at the end of Mass Effect 2? They, they all survived. However, I did have to play through the end twice because Morden kept dying. Yeah, he's kind of a jerk. I know. You, who, who would have known that a scientist can't wield a gun real well? Seriously, I mean, you, you think? <laughs> no, I, like, I, there's there's some people who are awesome who are just like, whatever happened, happened, and I'm not going back and replaying it. I can't do it. <laughs> like, I was like, no, I can't let these people die because I'm an idiot. Uh, so I had to go back and save the people. So I saved everybody. Um, I killed the Rachni off because uh, I was playing pretty much a renegade player. Um... I'm trying to think what are the major decisions that I make. Oh, I, I, I kept the base at the end. Okay, and did you save uh, the council or not? No, I did not. I let them burn. Nice. Um, I'm very mean. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, someone wants to know, if we import a default Femship base into Mass Effect 3, will it automatically change to the new default Femship? Um... I don't actually know the answer to that question, unfortunately. I don't think it would because it's an import, so we're just using whatever face he went with. But I can't 100% guarantee. I've never really done it or tried it, and that's kind of outside of my jurisdiction of things I was kind of responsible for or worked on or helped look at. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Um... Yeah. That's the thing about a game like this. Like, I get questions on Twitter all the time. Like I'm pretty active on Twitter, as you know. And people ask me questions, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and they're like, how do you not know? I'm like, there's 150 plus people that work on the game. Like, I, I got to give credit to all those guys. Like, I played a very, very, very small part of this team. Um, not even just the design team, just the entire team. Just so many cinematic animators and cinematic designers and sound guys. And we had um, 
composers. We had like five composers. I think Sam Hewlett's actually listening to this right now. So hi, Sam. Uh, we had amazing composers and like all these different people brought this product together. Like I'm just one person and I played a very small role on this. So like, I don't know everything that happened in the game. I don't, there's still parts of the game I don't know. Like a lot of the side content came in late and I haven't played it. So I'm looking forward to play uh, a lot of the, the late game or the, the side content that we build, the side missions that we that I haven't checked out. Uh, a lot of cinematics came on really late. Like that launch trailer came on, which is an absolutely amazing trailer. And there was some stuff in there. I'm like, I haven't seen that before. <laughs> like, because either I haven't seen the cinematic or I skipped past it because my job is like to get to gameplay and test my stuff and make it work. So I would just be skipping past everything, all the dialogue. Um, so while I've played through the most of the game, like I've played all the levels, I know the entire story and all the, the ways things work, I don't know all the specifics necessarily. Mm-hmm. Understandable. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Do, any, uh, do any of the guys in the room have any questions for senior designer of the uh, game? He designed most of the powers for the characters in Mass Effect 3. Co-op in the campaign? Uh, is there going to be co-op in the campaign? Uh, there's no co-op in the campaign. The only co-op is the multiplayer uh, that you guys have kind of played. Okay. Um... We didn't want to. We didn't want to ruin. You know, that was a big worry when people when multiplayer got announced. Like you're gonna ruin Mass Effect, and you know we don't want three shepherds running around the level. And if you do co-op in, in Mass Effect as we know it currently, like, you know, if one person shepherd and everybody else is not shepherd, they're gonna be happy because part of the game is about being Commander Shepherd. Um, so we didn't want to kind of ruin and and sully that single player experience that we've built so well, and and anger those fans and anger ourselves because we're fans as well. So we made a very conscious decision to make multiplayer fits in narratively, where you're kind of like the strike team forces that are holding down areas in the world. Um, and it works well with the Galactic War, but it doesn't, it's not Commander Shepard. There's a very good reason for that. Okay. Um, anyone else have any good questions? Because I'm pretty tapped out. I am too tired to think. <laughs> well, you should take a nap while your buddies take over or something. I'm tempted to, but I have another uh, call coming in in an hour, I believe, actually. Okay, who are you talking to next? Uh, oh, no, no, uh, that's going to be... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, in an hour. Uh, it's Mr. Thomas Abram. Okay, cool. And then at 4 p.m., I believe, uh, Mark Muir uh, said he would be calling in. Very awesome. I've never got a chance to talk to Mark. He was out of the Edmonton launch party, because he's actually from Edmonton. Uh, so... He, everyone says he's an awesome guy. Like all the Edmonton developers that I talked to, were like Mark Mir is awesome. So yeah. it's like really, it's really exciting. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to talking to him, especially about uh, the fan film that's going to be in. Uh, I think it's called Red Sand. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I saw that uh, trailer or whatever. Yeah, that, that looks like it's going to be pretty cool. Um, yep. So yeah, I guess we can uh, just end this here. Thank you so much for calling in. Hey, thank you guys so much for your passion, your love of Mass Effect, for setting up this charity. I uh, hope anyone listening will, you know, put five dollars, ten dollars, and donate. Uh, and I really hope you guys uh, enjoy Mass Effect Three. Uh, you feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Man Your Hair. You can tell me what you like and hate, and we want to hear your honest comments as long as it's not just trolling, because we've got to make things better in the future. I'm sure there's things that you're gonna love, and there's hopefully there's not too much to dislike, but. Love to hear about it. So thanks for guys for so much of the support. And good luck the rest of the way.